How do you get into this place, Mr. Milton? Down the back, through the mews in Slaven Street. Mm, looks as though it might do. Let's go around. What might you be needing it for, Mr. Martin? It's store antiques and furniture in general. Then it ought to suit you. It's fireproof and thoroughly dry. Come this way. What's left of the booking office now? Bill Moran. Mr. Martin seems to have done his work very satisfactorily. I carried out your instructions on the letter, Professor. Now, Moran, let's get our bearing. That wall, I take it, faces Pelden Street. Exactly. Originally, the main entrance to the station. And the lift shaft? Yeah, around this side. Eighty feet below. Quite a drop. Hey, Moran. <laughs> the power was cut off, of course, when they closed the station. How about lunch, Mr. Holmes? Mm. What do you fancy? A nice little bit of boiled cod? Oh. My dear Mrs. Hudson, life is sufficiently dull at the moment without adding boiled cod. But there's nothing better for an invalid. Yes, but I object to being referred to as an invalid, Mrs. Hudson. I'm a little run down, possibly. But... So I should think. With all the tobacco you smoke, you'll be getting secretine poisoning next. Well, in that case, Mrs. Hudson, I shall always stick to you. Oh, oh Mr. Holmes. <laughs> That'll be the doctor. It's this infernal atmosphere. Oh, I suppose it is pretty thick. Sick? My dear Holmes, it's intolerable. You could cut it with a knife. Why do you can open the window? You walked here, I perceive. Yes. And on the left-hand side of the street. Yes, that's right. But how in the world did you know? My dear fellow, it's simplicity itself. You've got a little reddish soil adhering to your shoe. They're pulling up the flagstones in front of the Wigmore Street Post Office, and as the pavement is covered with that reddish soil, it's difficult to avoid treading in it. The post office is on the left-hand side of the street. Oh, of course. When you put it like that, it does sound simple. Yeah. It's elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. By the way, Holmes, I hope you've decided to take that holiday I prescribed. Well, up to nine o'clock this morning, I was distinctly averse to the idea. But I've received a letter from an old friend of ours which inclines me to change my mind. I'm delighted to hear it. Who's it from? Hmm. My dear fellow, I read it. My dear Holmes, I'm sending you and the doctor yet another invitation to visit me here. Believe it or not, it's 20 years since you disposed of the Hound of the Baskervilles for it. Bless my sir, can you believe that, Watson? It seems impossible to me. My daughter Diana is anxious to make your acquaintance. Yes, but she's engaged, Watson. The young Trevor, a neighbor of theirs. Oh. I know you hate the country, just as I hate London. But stretch a point and come down for a week or two with Watson. Yours ever, Henry Baskin. Father's asked Sherlock Holmes to come here for a few days. Why? The family hound come to life again? Oh, don't be absurd. Hello, you two youngsters. Oh, Dad, do you really think there's any chance of Mr. Holmes coming here? Well, as you know, I haven't been able to persuade him in the past. Uh, for the post, sir. Oh, <coughs> thank you, Dad. Holmes is a creature of habit. He likes to bury himself in Baker Street and work out his problems with the aid of... I don't know how many ounces of tobacco a day. Oh, I must say, I'd like to meet him. He sounds a terribly brainy sort of chap. I wonder if he's any good at spotting winners. <laughs> no, no. Holmes' is hobby is spotting criminals, Jay. I don't think racing's quite in his province. Well, Watson, what about it? Could you get away for a fortnight? Yes, I think so. The hoped-for epidemic of measles hasn't materialized. Things are rather slack. I could get a locum to carry on for me. Good, good. And I will stretch a point and write to Bastrophe. Ah, good morning, Lestrade. Anything important on hand? Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Ah, you, Doctor. Not at all. You've the air of something unusual having occurred. Well, yes, Mr. Holmes. 
Well, tell me about it. Have you find a cigar on the table? Thank you. I'm uh, leaving London. Well, God bless my soul. This is a very sad development, Watson. With Professor Moriarty, that Napoleon of crime, still at large. <laughs> you and your Professor Moriarty, Mr. Holmes. He is hand behind every other crime in the calendar. The yard doesn't share your views, I'm afraid. They think it's all moonshine. Well, moonshine's a brighter thing than fog, I suppose. <laughs> Oliver, tell me where you're going. Uh, Exeter. Exeter? Oh. Promoted chief inspector. Reorganizing the traffic, I presume. No, no. Barchester races. Half the West Country turn up. And they make Exeter their headquarters. Okay, well, good luck, Lestrade. If your talent for organization is equal to your flair for detection, Barchester races should be something of a sensation. Thank you, sir. And in case it's any use to you, the chief hmm? constable, Colonel Russ, gave me something good for the Barchester Cup. Oh, what is it? His own horse. Silver Blaze. Well, I'm afraid I'm not much of a betting man, Lestrade, but Watson here thinks he knows something about racing. Silver Blaze. He was round about ten to one at the last call over. You won't get anything like that on him tomorrow, Doctor. Mm -hmm. It's an open secret that he did a trial yesterday which put him among the greatest stairs of all time. You're becoming quite a tipster, Lestrade. Yes, our handy guide to the turf. Well, anyway, he carries my money. Better to be on a certainty at short odds and down the course to hundred to one, say I. There you are, Watson. Make a note of that. As a matter of fact, the Doctor and I are going down to the West Country to stay with Sir Henry Baskerville, so we may possibly see you. I hope so, Mr. Holmes. And if you do feel like having a flutter, Doctor, don't forget Silver Blaze. Watson, put a bit on for me. What? Looks fit enough, Colonel. Best horse I ever owned. Hey, Straker. You're right, sir. But you'd make a good one to beat him. You fancy Lord Manston's horse, don't you? Desbury, yes, I have got a bit on him. Uh, we'll see how they stand at the betting tomorrow. There's a call over today at the Victoria Club. Oh, we'll probably hear all about it tonight. Oh, uh, before I go, could I have a word with you alone, Colonel? Certainly. What is it? Well, I... I want to ask you a favor. I hope you won't mind. Could you lend me... Well, I really want 500 pounds. Monkey. That's pretty cool, isn't I'm it? I'm in the devil of a hole or I wouldn't ask for it. Yeah, but why come to me? Why not Sir Henry Baskerville? Well, it's to do with racing debts, and Sir Henry's terribly down on racing. Well, have you, uh, have you tried your bank? You've got security. Mortgaged up to the hill. Oh, well, what about, uh, what about one of those financial firms? No, that's no good. I've been dealing with old Bingham. He won't spring another fiver. What, Albert Bingham, the moneylender? Oh, I'm sorry. There's nothing doing. Well, thanks all the same. I may want you again shortly. Those instructions, Martin. Sure. I'm expecting a visitor in a few minutes. You'd better stand by with Prince till he goes. Very good, Professor. Hey, bring him in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Stanford. I understand you wish to consult me. Yes, that's right. What is your business? Look here, Professor, I'm a commission agent in a big way. I'm fully aware who and what you are. Well, in that case, I'll come to the point. I've laid bets amounting to over £150,000 against Silver Blaze for the Barchester Cup, when his price was 100 to 6 against. You follow that? Perfectly. His trial yesterday proves he's a smasher, a world beater. At the call over at the Victoria Club tonight, he finished up a firm favourite at 7 to 2 against. I can't lay off anything to speak of, so to cut a long story short, if Silver Blaze wins the Cup, I go out of business. I see. And you wish me to arrange that Silver Blaze does not come under starter's orders, is that it? Exactly. Hmm. I must confess that this is a somewhat unusual experience, even for me. I've had some little association with the turf, merely as a form of recreation. And I have found in general that bookmakers are an honorable body of men. See here, Professor, I haven't come Sit here. Sit down. 
I presume you are aware that what you are asking is out of my usual line of business. I thought you were prepared to take on anything for a consideration. Quite. Depends on the size of the consideration. Well, I've told you what I stand to lose. What's your price? Ten thousand pounds. <whistles> Pretty steep, isn't it? It's not my custom to argue about these matters, Mr. Stanford. Take it or leave it. Very well. Then that settles it. Now, Mr. Stanford, a few details. Where is the horse train? King's Pyland, Dartmoor. Colonel Ross is training stable. Ross. Very good. Now give me all the information you can about the Colonel's employees and their neighbors on the moor. You know anything about them? Yes, it so happens that I do. As regards his neighbors, there's Sir Henry Baskerville, young Trevor, and uh, Silas Brown, who trains for Lord Manston at Capleton. As to his employees, there's Straker, his trainer, Mrs. Straker, Hunter, the head lad, and the usual stable boys. And... Why's the bloke you drove here to see the boss? A fellow named Stanford, Bookie. Did he tell you anything? No. Don't suppose he's come round here to hand out tips, do you? <laughs> so he's pretty deeply involved. Up to his neck. I know everything about him. He's bet with me for years. He owes a packet to Albert Bingham, the moneylender. Bingham? Lots of racing people deal with him. That's the name, Moran. Buy up all his debts from Bingham and from any other quarters you can find. Don't haggle about the price. Buy quickly. I want to get the whip hand over that gentleman at the earliest possible moment. Very good. When that's done, you'll be ready to leave with me for Dartmoor. I'm going home now, Straker. I shall be there if you want me. Take every precaution. That's all right, sir. Hunter here sleeps in his box every night. His bed's pushed across the door and he bolts himself in from the inside. No one could even attempt to enter without waking him. Good. I can trust you, Straker. Tell me, Jack. What is the matter? Nothing the matter, dear, really. Oh, yes, there is. I noticed it the moment you arrived. You're worried about something, aren't you? <laughs> really, darling, it's nothing. Here's the car. A riot have they, good. Well, here we are, Watson. Come along. My dear Holmes, delighted to see you. We're very delighted to come. And you too, Doctor. Oh, that's very kind of you. Ted, looking at you both, I can't believe it's 20 years. Oh, oh you flatter us. Okay, come along. I, I, I want you to meet my daughter. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted. Diana, this is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Trevor. Now, how about a whiskey and soda after your journey? Oh, thank you. Huh? I'm sure that's what Dr. Watson would prescribe. Well, if I did, you'd automatically refuse to take it. He grows more obstinate with the years, Baskerville. That's the way with most of us. Well, well make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. Well, now, Baskerville, tell me something about yourself. Oh, no, 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 Holmes. That won't do. You've got to do that. Carl's been promising us all a treat, Mr. Holmes. We shall see you in action. Yes, but Sir Henry is the victim. I mean that we should see Mr. Holmes do his stuff. <laughs> his stuff? It's a modern expression, Watson, signifying to display one's talents. That's you know? right. I want Mr. Holmes to tell us what Father's been doing for the last 20 years just by looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> you evidently have great faith in my abilities, Miss Baskerville. But I'm afraid there's very little data. I merely observe that since we last met, your father has taken to billiards that he's recently played a hundred up with Mr. Trevor. So totally correct, Holmes, but how... Oh, my dear fellow, it's simplicity itself. I observe that both you and Mr. Trevor have traces of blue chalk between the forefinger and thumb of your left hand, which was put there, obviously, to steady the cue. Uh, I hope that satisfies you, Diana. Well, I, I expect you'd like to see your rooms. I'll show you, Mr. Holmes. You'll Did stay you and me? dine, Jack. Thanks. If you'll take me as I am, and don't mind my rushing off immediately afterwards, I've got to ride over the moor to King's Pyland. I'm trying to get Straker to persuade Colonel Ross to buy one of my ponies. <laughs> That's all right, my boy. Come along. How's that curry coming along, Lizzie? Just about ready, Mrs. Straker. 
come aside for Hunter when you've dished up. Take it across to him in Silver Blaze's box. Get it, Goodman. <laughs> Everything all right, Hunter? Yes, thank you, sir. I do hope Mr. Straker isn't late. He specially asked for curry. Oh, he shouldn't be long now, Mum. Dinner's ready, Jim. All right. I'll just go and have a watch. Lizzie, don't forget Hunter's supper. Oh, no, Mum. I'm keeping it up for him. All right, then you can bring ours in now. Very good, Mum. Time. Well, I've had a lot to attend to. Is the Colonel coming over again before the race? He didn't say so. I'm quite satisfied with your great surprise. Who are you sending in the horse box, Silver Blade? The Hunter, of course. He seems to will probably follow along with it. What's the betting on Silver Blade? Seven to two, I think, was the last call over. Here's your supper, Ted. Thanks. Thanks, Ted. Bye bye, Liz. Anybody above? Oh, it's you, Mr. Trevor. Baker at home? Yes, sir. Look after the mayor for me, will you, sir? Very good, sir. In. Not a bit. Come in. Called round to have a chat about that pony. Uh, sit down. Have a drink? Whiskey? Thanks. Whose horse is that, Simpson? Mr. Trevor's, ma'am. Haven't you seen him? He wanted a governor. Oh. I suppose he came. I was in the kitchen. Well, that's really all I came about. I want the Colonel to have the first refusal. I might tell him the price I've quoted and let me know what he says. Very good, Mr. Trevor. Oh, uh... Oh, well, never mind. Harry. Mary, where have you been? Oh, just returned round the yard. Ah. You have a look at Silver Blaze? No, I just went for a breath of air. By the way, Silver Blaze doing another trial tomorrow? Yes, with the last before the race. Oh, well, I'm for an early night. Doesn't seem to be much to stay up for. Where's the governor? Why isn't he in the yard? What's up? Did 
anything wrong with Silver Blaze. No. Gone? Yes. And I'm just dead. You must have a long this morning, Holmes. Oh, thank you. I should like to. There are a few improvements since you were here last. Yes. Oh, why, it's Ross. Uh, who's there with him? Well, unless I'm much mistaken, that's my old friend Lestrade. Recently a member of the London police force. Now transferred to Exeter. Uh, hello, Ross. Morning, Master. This is an early visit. Well, Lestrade, I didn't expect to see you so soon. You are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I presume? Yes, and, and this is Dr. Watson. Now, how do you do? I feel like I could find Mr. Trevor here. Why, yes. Uh, here this, Mr. Trevor. Ah, I wonder where it is you, Mr. Trevor. Let's see, Ross, what's happened? That's a devil to pay, Baskerville. Last night, Silver Blaze was stolen. Hunter, my head lad, poisoned, and Straker has vanished. What's that got to do with Jack? That's what I'm here to find out. Well, perhaps we'd better go indoors. Uh, come along, Ross. Now, Mr. Trevor, I'm in charge of this case, and I want to ask you a few questions. At the same time, I must warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence. You were at King's Pylon last night. I rode over from here after dinner, yes. Why were you over at King's Pylon, Mr. Trevor? To see Straker about the sale of a polo pony. At all? Yes. Why? You didn't make that an excuse to try and get information from the stable boys about Silver Blaze, for instance. What the devil do you mean? Not interested in Silver Blaze, perhaps. I'm interested in the race, certainly. So are thousands of other people. Now, Mr. Trevor. Uh, just one moment, Lestrade. If you would allow me. Mr. Trevor, you say you've discussed the sale of a polo pony with Mr. Straker. Was anyone else present? Uh, no. But not even Mrs. Straker? No. Quite. Now, Mr. Trevor. You said just now that you weren't particularly interested in Silver Blaze. You haven't by any chance to have your betting book on you? I think so. Why? Do you mind if I see it? My duty to tell you that I can't demand to see it. Not now, that is, but... Here it is. Hmm. I see you bet Desborough, the second favourite to the Barchester Cup, to win you 5,000 pounds, Mr. Trevor. 5,000? But, Jack, you told me you only had a few pounds on it. I'm sorry, dear. I had my own reasons. Before you go any further, Lestrade, may I ask if it's your intention to apply for a warrant against Mr. Trevor? Not at the moment, Mr. Holmes. It's my duty to warn him. I'm in your hands, Inspector. I won't run away. As a justice of the peace, I will be answerable for Mr. Trevor. You'd better stay here, Jack, while the investigation's going on. Oh, thank you, Sir Henry. Very well. Now, ah, Mr. Holmes, I may as well be frank with you. There are things in this case which completely baffle me. Really? You surprise me. I was saying to Colonel Rust that I'd be glad of your cooperation. Well, the case certainly has some points of interest. Uh, but uh, what does Colonel Ross say? Personally, I should prefer to leave the case in the hands of the official police force. Uh, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, I have not much use for amateur detectives. Oh, come, Colonel, come. Uh, even they have their uses. Of course, I've heard of you, Mr. Holmes. They say you've never been beaten. Well, it's true. I've been generally successful. Well, I hope you'll be so with me. I wish to leave no stone unturned to avenge Straker and recover my horse. Very well, Lestrade. I'm at your service. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'll be getting along. I'll see you later at King's Pilot. Oh, really, Holmes, I must protest. You're down here to recuperate, you know. Undoubtedly, my dear doctor, but only last night you suggested a tonic. Well, here is one ready made. Yes, please, Mr. Holmes, for my sake and Jack's. Oh, well, Watson, that settles it. Miss Baskerville, you may rely upon my doing all I can. I had to have the body taken to the cottage to make my examination, but nothing else has been disturbed. Well, that hasn't taken it long, Colonel. Oh, no, they're very good roads in Devonshire. Mr. Holmes is coming over from Baskerville Hall to give us what help he can. He's been some slight assistance to me in the past, and anyway, he can't do any harm. Ah, here is Mr. Holmes. Dr. Salter, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. This is Silver Blaze's box. What, in your opinion, was the cause of death, Doctor? An overdose of powdered opium. In that case, he would have died in his sleep. That is so. Uh, the remains of the lad's supper, I presume? Yes, curried mutton. Oh, curry? Hmm. That's significant, Lestrade. I don't know, Mr. Holmes. Any food containing sufficient poison could cause death. Oh, would it really? Really, I hadn't thought of that. You, know, you must read my little monograph on the whole art of poisoning. And did the people of the house partake of the same dish without any ill effect? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, then, what is your theory? 
Mr. Trevor, while standing at the open window, passed his hand through and placed the poison in the curried mutton? Exactly, and quite easy, as you can see. Well, and then what? He opened the door with a duplicate key, took out the horse and led it to some secret hiding place. The evidence against him is very strong. It is purely circumstantial. It would be equally easy for the murderer, with the aid of a stick or a hunting crop, to pull back the bolt of the door. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. yes, quite easy, as you say, Leslie. Where is the stable boy who discovered the crime? Somewhere outside in the yard. Would you let me see him? Certainly, I'll fetch him. Your name, Simpson? Yes, sir. You hope you have a distinct taste, is it not, Doctor? Yes. Not unpleasant, but quite distinct. Oh, quite. I thought so. Oh, is this the boy? Yes. Now, my lad, you say that Mr. Trevor dismounted at the gates and asked you to water his horse? Yes, sir. And then? He went towards the cottage, sir. And in doing so, he would, of course, have to pass Silver Blaze's box? Yes, sir. He went along that side. But you didn't actually see him pass the box? No, sir. I am a back to him. Yes. Thank you. That'll do. You can go back to your quarters. Very good, sir. Would you like to question Mrs. Traker, Mr. Holmes? Uh, not at the moment. But by the way, Colonel, there's another training stable. Quite close, I believe. Yes, Capleton. Silas Brown trains Lord Manston's horses there. Lord Manston's Desborough's second favourite. Yes. Ah. Well, then, with the exception of Baskerville Hall and Trevor's place, your only neighbour would be Silas Brown. Yes. I phoned Brown at once on the discovery of a crime. Ah, he knows nothing. Oh. Well, there's nothing to connect Mr. Trevor with the Capleton stable. Nothing. Well, by the way, Colonel, have you an old shoe of Silver Blaze? Uh, yes, here. How about this one? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'll put it in my pocket for luck. And have you a photograph of the horse? Yes, sir. This too? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, do you mind? Not at all. Now, Watson, let us transfer our activities to the moor. That building on the skyline, I presume, is capable. Yes. There's an imprint of a hoof here. Slight but quite distinct. An exact fit. And here a footmark. Good Lord! What's that? Watson. It's Straker! Obviously, he followed the thief, caught him up here, there was a struggle, he paid with his life. And here's the torch he used to trace the horse. This is a very singular knife. Surely this is something in your line, Watson. Oh, yes. It's what we call a cataract knife. Yeah. As I thought. Devised for very delicate work. It's a curious weapon for defence, Lestrade. The best he could lay hands on at the moment, I suppose. Mm, yes. Yes, he is, very possibly. No trace of blood, I can see. Why, that streaker's coat. This is curious, Lestrade. What, Mr. Holmes? Looks as though the murderer let him take his coat off before the struggle. Couldn't he have taken it off afterwards? Well, that's one explanation. Though it's difficult to see with what motive. However, take it, Miss Fred, and make a careful inventory of everything you find in the pocket. Very good, Mr. Holmes. And now I suggest that you and the Colonel return to King's Highland and arrange for the removal there of the body. And then perhaps you'd be good enough to meet us with the car uh, by that bridge and say an hour's time. Dr. Watson and I are going to take a little walk over the moor. Very good, Mr. Holmes. In an hour's time. Now, Watson, 
Let us leave the question of who killed Straker for the moment and confine ourselves to finding out what has become of the horse. Well, how are you going to set about it? Well, a horse will always herd with its kind. Silverblaze, if left to himself, would either have returned to King's Pyland or gone to Capleton. If my assumption is correct, that is our direction. Hoof prints again. Let's carry on a little further. Look, Watson. Look here. There's a man's footprints beside the horses. A man wearing square-toed boots. Oh, but the horse was alone before. Precisely, it was alone before. Here we are. Here's the same footprint. This time they're coming from Cape Yes, Yes, let's follow the trail. Looks in the pink, doesn't it? Yes, ready for anything. Aren't you desperate? Let's see. What is in the bedding today? Five to one. Second favourite. Journey oh. dead, Watson. We don't want any loiterers here. I only want to ask a question. Am I too early to see Mr. Silas Brown? Well, I don't know, sir. He was up rather late last night. What is Orson? No gossiping. Get on in your job. Very good, sir. And what the devil do you want here? Five minutes talk with you, my good sir. I've no time for talking. And we don't want no strangers here. This is a matter of vital importance. Very well. Shall we talk it over here or inside? All right. Come on. I shan't keep you more than a few minutes, Watson. Well, that's all right, Holmes. Now, Mr. Brown, I'm at your service. Well, I'm glad you realize that it's no use trying to bluff me. Yes, that's quite a clever bit of faking, Brown. Don't give me away. I'll return the horse. Very well. But providing you do as I tell you. Now, Brown, no tricks. You understand? I understand, sir. Your instructions will be carried out faithfully. Very well. You guard him night and day and engage a special detective escort when you take him to Barchester. I will do everything you say, sir. The horse shall be there. Very well. But remember, you may trust me, sir. Yes. Yes, I think I can. I'm sorry to keep you, Watson. Oh, that's all right. Well, a more perfect compound of the bully and coward than Silas Brown, I've seldom met with. The horse is there, then? Yes. Of course, he tried to bluff it out. But I described to him so exactly what his actions had been last night that he's convinced I was watching it. Well, what actually happened, Holmes? I'll tell you. Now I must go and collect Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. I must say I haven't much hope of their having found the horse. I'll be here when you come back. Charlie Brown was running at tremendous risk. Oh, my dear Watson, Silas is an old horse faker. He left nothing to chance. You actually saw the horse? Yes. Well, I must say this for Silas. He certainly made a good job of it. Well, aren't you afraid to leave it with him? My dear fellow, he'll guard it as the apple of his eye. He knows that his only hope of mercy is to produce it safe. Horse stealing is a serious crime. Now, Colonel Ross doesn't impress me as a man who'd be likely to show much mercy in any case. Well, the matter doesn't rest with Colonel Ross. I follow my own methods and tell as much or as little as I choose. I don't know whether you've observed it, Watson, but the Colonel's manner to me has been somewhat rude. I'm inclined to keep him in suspense. Say nothing about the horse. Well, of course not, Holmes, without your permission. <laughs> Good old Watson. Ah, here's Lestrade with the car. Well, 
Well, Mr. Holmes, seen anything? Yes, yes, we've seen some very interesting things, Lestrade. Boots. Boots? Yes, square-toed boots. Well, now, Mr. Holmes, make us cottage, please. I hope Mr. Holmes won't be long. I want to phone the story through in time for the six o'clock edition. Ah, Mr. Holmes, I represent the Western Mail. I understand you're taking up this case. No, no, certainly not. I'm just Holmes the busybody, retained by the police to supply their deficiencies. Oh, Inspector, there are several points upon which I should like to ask your advice. I must consider whether I don't owe it to the public to uh, scratch the horse immediately. Certainly not. I should let the name stand. My business with Mr. Holmes now is private, if you don't mind. Right you are. I've got something to go on with anyhow. Good day, everybody. I'm very glad to have had your opinion, sir. Well, Doctor, have you made your examination? Yes. Straker was killed by a savage blow from some blunt, heavy instrument delivered with enormous force. No, straight. Let me see his coat. Will you have it there? Yes, here it is. Thank you. I presume you made the inventory I asked for. Don't ask me, Mr. Holmes. Letter in envelope. London postmark. Pipe. Briar wood pipe, Lester. Pouch. Pouch of seal skin. Matches. They're foreign. Telegram. Handed in at Coombe Tracy. Let's see what the letter says first. Bingham and Co. Financier, 52A Bond Street, London, W1. J. Straker, Esquire, King's Pylant Stables, Devon. Dear sir, please receive this as official notification that your commitments to us, secured by six promissory notes, were today purchased by Mr. Leslie Martin of 15 Lamb Street West, to whom you are now accountable, yours faithfully, Bingham and Co. Our friend Straker seems to have been somewhat financially embarrassed. Now for the telegram. For cup final, send instructions. We'll meet you as we agreed. Marty. I think Mrs. Straker might be able to help us here. She's in her room. I'll fetch her. Thank you, Doggo. I don't think she'll be much assistance, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, she and Straker went to bed about the usual time. When she woke up in the morning, she found it gone. Yes, still, I'd like a word or two with her, Lestrade, regarding her husband's habit. No one like a wife, I'll tell you that. Eh, uh, uh, what? Yes, yes, quite. Mm. You remember I have these, Lestrade? Pray don't think it a liberty. Not at all. You're welcome. I see nothing in them. Oh, Mr. Lestrade, have you discovered anything? No, Mrs. Straker. Mr. Holmes has come over to help us. We shall do all that's possible. I won't detain you a moment, Mrs. Straker. I realize what you're going through. I just want to ask you this. Are you by any chance a light sleeper? Yes, Mr. Holmes. As it happens, I am. I noticed a dog in the yard. Does he sleep out there at night? Yes, always. He's a very good watcher. So you didn't by any chance hear him barking during the night? No, I didn't. No. No. Just one thing. Was your husband interested in football? Oh, no. Racing was the only thing that interested him. And there's just one further question, Mrs. Straker. You had curry for some last night. Did you mention that to anyone outside the house? Why, no. No, thank you, Mrs. Straker. I don't think I need intrude upon your time and patience any longer. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Colonel, you have a few sheep in the paddock. Have you had anything wrong with them of late? No, I don't think so. Oh, now you mention it. I believe that one of my stable lads did report that three of the sheep had gone lame. Ah. Why do you ask? Ah. We're just a long shot, Colonel. A very long shot. Lestrade, uh, let me recommend to your attention this singular epidemic among the sheep. You consider it important, Mr. Holmes? Oh, yes, yes, exceedingly so. Is there any other point to which you want to draw my attention? Well, uh, to the uh, curious incident of the dog in the night time. dog was perfectly quiet in the night? No, that was the curious incident. Oh. Well, I'm going to Baskerville Hall. Will you be following? Yes, yes, very possibly, Mr. Hello. 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 Could you please give me Coombe Tracy Post Office? Yes. Yes, I'll hold on. 
It traces a small village, is it not? Yes, just a hamlet. And then the postmaster would like you to remember any strangers who came between. I think so. Hello. Hello, is that the postmaster, Coombe Tracy? Look, I'm speaking for Mr. Straker, King's Pylon. He received a telegram yesterday, signed Martin, dispatched from your office. If he cannot recall anybody of that name, could you uh, kindly describe the sender to me? Yes. Oh, there were, there were two of them. Oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very much obliged to you. You think the telegram's important? Very much so, Watson. Well, au revoir, Colonel. We've had a charming little breath of your beautiful Dartmoor air. Then you despair of arresting the murderer of James Straker. Well, there are certainly grave difficulties in the way, but I've every hope that your horse will start, and I beg you'll have your jockey in readiness. And you've nothing definite to tell me. When we meet at the races, Colonel. What do you make of it all, Holmes? Mm. It's innocent looking enough at first sight, Watson. But the fact that Straker was not interested in football persuaded me that this is not to be taken at its face value. You observed, of course, that the name of Martin appeared in both the letter and the telegram. Yes, it struck me as curious. Yes, highly significant, Watson. This telegram is peculiarly interesting. You mean it's in code? Yes, and a very elementary one. By simply crossing out each alternate word, the message assumes an entirely different meaning. Instead of a request, it becomes a peremptory order. I know. Instructions meet as agreed. Martin. What did the postmaster at Coombe Tracy tell you? He described the senders. Two strangers. Unquestionably Moriarty and Moran. Watson, the professor, is behind all this. You mean he's responsible for the deaths of Hunter and Straker? Of Hunter, yes. Of Straker, no. In fact, I fancy that Straker's death was the most unfortunate thing that could possibly happen from Moriarty's point of view. All through the season, my luck was dead out. I found myself in trouble to the tune of 4,000 pounds. I went to Bingham and raised what I could. And as a last plunge, I backed Desborough to win me 5,000. <laughs> Make or break. Oh, why didn't you come to me, my boy? Well, you're not a betting man, Sir Henry, and I was afraid you wouldn't understand. That's why I kept it dark, even from Diana. And now that loathsome inspector. Oh, come now, it's no use calling him names. In, in view of these bets, he'd every reason to be suspicious. I don't care. He's a thoroughly nasty person. I disliked him from the first moment I met him. Inspector Lestrade. Any news, Inspector? Yes, very grave news, Sir Henry. We found Straker's body. Body? Do you mean he's murdered? <gasps> on the moor, about a mile from King's Pylon. Sherlock Holmes takes up the case. Sherlock Holmes, Moran. Once again, that man is crossing my path. What's this news mean, Professor? What's gone wrong? What does this man Holmes know? I tell you, if Silver Blaze goes to the post and he's fit... There is a big difference, Mr. Stanford, between a horse going to the post and winning the race. You've had my assurance. I am not in the habit of failing my clients. Moran, tell Barton to take Mr. Stanford home, then come straight back. Yes, sir. Prince, now four o'clock. Have the car ready in 15 minutes. Very good, Professor. Are we out for a long run? Yes. We've got to be back in Devon well before midnight. And Prince, we'll need the gun. Okay. What have you got there, Prince? Oh, you haven't seen this little gadget before, have you? No. You hadn't joined us when it was last used. Let's have a look. It's a magazine air gun, absolutely silent and immensely powerful. Made specially for the professor by a well-known foreign gunsmith. Hmm, seems you're going to use it again. Oh, there you are, Barton. I want you to take Mr. Stanford home. Yes, we're in deeper waters than you think, Lestrade. But we must take the case one step at a time. Now, I've progressed so far, I'm glad to say, as completely to exonerate Mr. Trevor. You've got to convince me, Mr. Harris. Well, I have every hope of doing so. Now, you will agree 
that Hunter was murdered in order that the horse could be stolen. Exactly, we all know that. But when I examined the remains of Hunter's supper, I remarked on the fact that it consisted of curry. Yes, but I still don't see. <laughs> well, perhaps I could help you to see. One or two other things as well. That was the first link in my chain of reasoning. Hunter was poisoned with powdered opium. And powdered opium is by no means tasteless. Well then, Mr. Holmes, why didn't the boy notice? By no means tasteless when mixed with any ordinary dish. Curry was exactly the medium which would disguise that taste. So, you remember that I asked Mrs. Straker if she told anyone they were having curry for supper that night. And she replied, no. Yes, I remember you putting that question. Well, it's surely too monstrous a coincidence to suppose that Trevor happened to come along with powdered opium on the very night when a dish was served which would disguise its flavor. That is unthinkable, Lestrade. That certainly is a strong point. And there's a further point. Even more significant, Lestrade, the silence of the dog. Though someone had been in the stable and fetched out the horse, the dog had not barked enough to arouse Mrs. Straker, who was a light sleeper. And obviously, the visitor was some member of the household. And then what do you make of it, Holmes? One thing for certain. Trevor becomes eliminated from the case. Well, I confess, Mr. Holmes, in view of what you say, I, I don't know what move to make. Make no move at the moment. Except to assure Mr. Trevor that all suspicions of him were unfounded. You know, our old friend, Miss Ray, has wrongfully to arrest the future son-in-law of Sir Henry Baskerville. I appreciate that. I'll speak to Mr. Trevor. Who's that taking my name in vain? Ah, oh, Mr. Trevor. I just had a little chat with Mr. Holmes. And I'm glad to say that he sees eye to eye with me. You quite understand that at the commencement of this case, it was my duty to follow up any clue, however slight. I don't mind telling you now that I never seriously suspected you. Well, he can't say fairer than that, can he? Well, I'm very glad you feel that way about it, Inspector. Yes, I still don't see how it helps us. Who did put the opium into the curry? Who did steal the horse and kill Hunter and Straker? My dear Lestrade, it's a capital mistake to theorize, for you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. Then you're not going to tell us anything, Mr. Holmes? Well, not at the moment, Miss Baskerville. There's one other link in the chain to be tested, and to do that, I'm afraid we must return to London tonight. Tonight? Yes, uh, Dr. Watson and I are sorry to have to run away like this. Well, there's nothing before the midnight train from Exeter. Dinner will be ready in a few moments. You have heaps of time to dine here in comfort before you go. Well, thank you. I, I shall be delighted. Well, I hope you'll stay and dine too, Inspector. Oh, thank you, sir. That's quite a museum piece, Sir Henry. Well, we've had it a long time. Hmm. Well, it's nearly 11, Holmes, and if we're to catch that midnight train from Exeter... I'll order the car. Don't bother, Sir Henry. I'll take Mr. Holmes and the doctor in mind. Well, thank you, Lestrade. It's a pity you've got to leave us, Holmes, and I'm sorry you can't tell us any more. You're leaving three very puzzled people. Well, I hope to solve the puzzle for you all on Cup Day, in Colonel Ross's box. I think he's going, Moran. Oh, Arnold, safe journey. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Quick, back to the car. Follow that car. When you get clear of the house, overtake her. I have the strongest reasons for thinking that Professor Moriarty is the brains behind this crime. You know, he seems quite an obsession with you. But you still don't believe in the Professor? Frankly, Mr. Holmes, I do not. Another few yards, Moran, then let them have it. Well, there's a car following him. Quick, down for your life.
Oh, are you hurt, Watson? Oh, only a few bruises. But oh. Where's the driver? Here I am, sir. I'm all right. Sure? No bones broken? My word, that is a lucky escape. Hello, but where's Lestrade? <clears throat> what shall you see, Lestrade? Lestrade! <laughs> Ah, oh, there you are, Lester. Well, would you believe in Professor Moriarty now? Straker and Hunter. I promise you should know everything today, Colonel, and you share. Now, oh, Watson, you've been having a little flutter, I see. What? Well, if you want to conceal it, I suggest you find a deeper pocket for your bidding ticket. <laughs> it's all very well, Mr. Holmes, but we're waiting. Yes. Well, Colonel, in the first place, it'll come as a shock to you to learn that Straker was a scoundrel, utterly unworthy of your confidence. Are you serious, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Acting under the orders of a master criminal who bought up his debts and so had it in his power to ruin him, he poisoned Hunter and then took Silver Blaze out on the moor in the dead of night. Oh, I can right. hardly believe it. Straker? But to what purpose? It was his intention to use that singular knife, you remember, I found in his hand, to nick one of the tendons of the horse. With your wide experience of the turf, Colonel, you know it's possible to do that subcutaneously and leave no trace. The result would be a slight lameness, which Put down a rheumatism or a strain in exercise. You say it was his intention. You mean he didn't succeed? No. I examined the knife. There was no trace of blood. But why didn't he do all this in the stable? Why take him out on the moor? Well, for the best of reasons. When so spirited a creature felt the nick of the knife, he would certainly have roused the soundest of sleepers. But how did you arrive at all this, Mr. Holmes? I found several clues, the chief of which was the knife. You remember my asking you if you found anything wrong with your sheep? Yes, I remember. When you told me that some of them had suffered from lameness, that confirmed my theory. That Straker, before tackling the delicate operation on the horse, had been practicing on the sheep. Good heavens. But who interrupted the plot? Who killed James Straker? I'll wave that question for a few minutes, Colonel. Hello, the numbers are going up. What number is Silver Blaze? Nine. 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 Two, three, four, five, six. That number six. By my truck, he's riding on the horse. Silver Blaze doesn't run. Look, Holmes. Silver Blaze doesn't run. This has been a mistake. The six should have been a nine. Mr. Holmes. I relied on you implicitly. Yes, and you may still do so, Colonel. That's my horse. Yes. And that's the murderer of James Straker. What? What? It was a kick from Silver Blaze that killed your trainer.
A bullet has penetrated the shoulder and lodged near the lung. But we heard nothing. You wouldn't. It was fired from an air gun. Noiseless and of tremendous power. How could it possibly be concealed in the crowd? In the interior of a specially designed kinematograph camera. Good heavens. But how on earth did you know? Well, I observed through the glasses a group of cameramen lined up near the winning post. I fancied I knew one of them. Mr. Holmes, what does this all mean? It means, Colonel, that you've been cheated of your race by the most cunning and dangerous criminal in London. Is there nothing can be done? Lestrade, who's the most likely man to give me some information on the betting for the cup? Difficult to say. Old Sam Silver's a member of the Victoria Club and a good friend of mine. Where can we find him? It's a hundred to one. He's in the champagne bar at this moment. I'll stay here with Martin, if you don't mind. There's no question about him. Stanford had laid over a hundred thousand pounds against Silver Blaze and got left with it. Point him out to me. There he is, Mr. Holmes, in the dark suit and the bowler. Thank you, Mr. Silver. Watson, I want you to take particular note of that man. Not a word, Sam. Trust me. Excuse me, Mr. Holmes. You're going to allow me to look after this? Yes, yes, but I think you need a little unofficial help. Just to supplement your usual happy mixture of cunning and audacity. Is there anything I can do? Yes, my dear Watson. Job that involves tenacity of purpose, of which, my dear fellow, you've given me so many proofs. Look, I want you to remain here and never lose sight of Stanford. Lestrade and I will drive straight back to Baker's. Yes. Lestrade, will you give instructions for your car to be at Dr. Watson's disposal? Certainly, Mr. Holmes. And you might tell your chauffeur to get into Mutton. As soon as Stanford leaves, follow him. When he arrives at his destination, send the car back to Baker's. Then go to the nearest phone box and tell me where you are and wait for me. Is that clear? Perfect. Watson's a long time phoning. Oh, patience, let's trade patience. Concentrate on the game. Yes, come in. Mr. Holmes, it's nearly midnight. You really must eat something. Can't I tempt you to a night with an addict? My dear Mrs. Hudson, you've always been a temptation to me. But addict at this moment is not. How about a nice sheep tea? No, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. <gasps> I suggest you go to bed. Very well, sir. Still your move, Lestrade. My mind's not on the game, Mr. Holmes. I wonder what has happened to Dr. Watson. Well, now, let's see. Five o'clock when we left the course. Now, oh, now it's nearly midnight. You ought to hear something soon. Tell me, Mr. Holmes, why did you leave Dr. Watson to do the training? Why not yourself? Because, my dear Lestrade, when you set out to draw a badger that's gone to earth, you send a ferret down after it, while the man with the gun remains outside. Professor Moriarty is the badger, Dr. Watson is the ferret, and I, my dear Lestrade, am the man with the gun. I see. And Stanford? Well, Stanford, if he's a wise man, will go straight to Moriarty with whatever price he's paying. When you finish with the professor, you'll be taken back to where we picked you up. You got the necessary on you, I suppose. Yes, of course. Okay. I want you to go straight to Mr. Holmes' rooms in Baker Street. you, Holmes. Watson speaking from Sladen News. Watson! Quickly, say there's something wrong. 
They've got what? Inspector Lestrade's chauffeur, sir. Good. Drive us to where you dropped Dr. Watson. Right. Oh. Yes. Quite correct, Mr. Stanford. I must say this case has proved more intricate than I anticipated. It should have been worth a trifle more. However, perhaps next time. Uh, you may go. Martin? Here. <laughs> next to Mr. Holmes himself, I don't know anyone who'd be more welcome. Hello. Professor, who do you think I got here of all people? No. <laughs> Dr. Watson. Eh? Watson, did you say? Dr. Watson? What's he doing here? Come on. Yeah. Yes. Caught him prowling around the yard. Shall I bring him in? No, not just yet, Fritz. I leave him alone with his thoughts for a while. Nothing like a little suspense. I imagine that three weeks' wait for the hangman is infinitely worse than the final interview. Eh, hey, Moran? You wait here. Come, let's straight. This is the news. Pretty solid, Lestrade. What building is this? This must be the back of the old Pelton Street tube station. What are you going to do, Mr. Holmes? Drive straight to Scotland Yard. And then? The headquarters of the London Transport. Now, Moran, I think we'll interview the doctor. That you, Prince? Bring in Dr. Watson. <laughs> right now. Now then, Doctor. This should be most amusing, Moran. Ah, come in, Doctor. I have had the pleasure of several interviews with Mr. Holmes, but never before with his talented friend and colleague. Would you sit down? May I ask what you are doing in this neighborhood? I good reason to think it was your neighborhood, Professor. Really? As a matter of curiosity, may I ask you how you got here? By following Mr. Holmes' instructions. Ah, I see. Then I'm afraid it's going to prove rather unfortunate for you, Doctor. I have not taken these somewhat elaborate precautions to conceal my whereabouts in order to have you report on the subject to Mr. Holmes. You mean I'm going to have some difficulty in leaving? Oh, no, my dear Doctor. Oh, dear. There will be no difficulty about that. But you will leave by the way I shall indicate. I will explain to you, Doctor. You are now in what was the Felden Street tube station. Behind that panel is the lift shaft. It's a sheer drop of 80 feet. If you have any last message to send to Mr. Holmes, I will see that it is delivered. Sherlock Holmes will follow Rickney with you, Moriarty, without any reminder from me. 
So that is your last word. Very good. I will now remove the panel and wish you a swift journey. Don't move any of you. Huh? Except you, my dear Watson, who I'm sure would be more comfortable with us. You must excuse me for trespassing on your private property. I've had the lift put in order again. You clever... Uh, no compliments, please. I arrest you, Robert Moriarty. On what charge? For being concerned in the murder of the stable boy, Edward Hunter. And for an attempt on the life of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and... That'll do to go on with, Lestrade. When the professor has answered to those charges, there will doubtless be a number of others to occupy his attention. Listen, Holmes. There's no prison can hold me. You know, I almost wish that were true, Professor. Life would be very dull without your activities. Watson, might I trouble you for a match? I think our quiet rest in the country has been a great success. Damn you, Holmes. I asked you. Well, it's the most amazing case we've ever solved, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Elementary.